no. Okay, that's running. Perfect. Um, yeah, my, my name is Sven Fuchs and I would like to uh, lead uh, and uh, guide through this quality workshop series together with uh, Ben Norden. And um, we agreed four weeks ago that we are talking about uh, different aspects uh, uh, of the heat flow determination and the first workshop should circle around conductivity as one main parameter. And uh, I would like to share my screen in this context. Um, I will, we will hop between my presentation and I would li also like to use the online Google Docs document. Uh, a lot of you have uh, already used for comments or suggestions. Um, for those who are not familiar, we, we created a Google Docs document where um, we, listened, uh, we, we listed the parameters and items of the database that are related to thermal conductivity. Uh, as a, a shared document where everyone can comment uh, on his or her view of the importance of the respective parameter and its influence on uh, uh, the heat flow documentation uh, or the heat flow value. Um, and this document should be used uh, in, in, in future as a, um, well, a written documentation of what we are doing so that this is transparent to everyone. Uh, uh, so with this, um, yeah, thanks uh, for your attention um, for this first workshop. Um, probably first of all, the goal today and um, um, probably of the next workshop uh, about conductivity is that we identify and discuss the information on thermal conductivity that is stored in the database uh, under the new uh, structure we have defined last year's and uh, that we discuss the relevance of single items or uh, aspects of conductivity for a potential quality scheme. Um, the agenda for today is uh, a short welcome. Uh, um, we need to agree on who is writing the protocol. And then the, the main point today, of course, is the discussion on different conductivity items of the database and its relevance. And um, I, I have blocked here 90 to 120 minutes. Actually, I know that this is a long time, so probably we can limit this to probably 90 minutes, um, well, that we are not, not, not totally exhausted afterwards. And if it becomes clear that we need more time, then we will have another workshop probably in four weeks where we can continue the discussion. So we have no time pressure today. We just start the process and look um, how this works for everyone. Uh, first of all, um, as last time, I would like to have that we are writing a protocol. Um, so again, the questions uh, into the round, uh, who would, that could be more than one person would be willing or able to, to help with a protocol that we can summarize the ideas, the comments and so on uh, from the community. So just raise your hands, that's totally okay. <laughs> okay, Ladislaus and Elif. You are muted so far. Yeah, yeah. hello, hello. I am muted, I'm sorry. Hello. Hi. It's okay for me, it's okay. Yeah. I accept. Ladislaus, you, you as well. So uh, it's it. I actually, I would prefer if it's, that are two persons because probably you have different perspectives or understand things differently. So we can merge those uh, comments together. Is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Then I just note this for later. And we can we can check this point. Perfect. Um, yeah, probably news first, uh, and um, I'm really glad uh, to inform you that um, uh, we are getting funding for a project that uh, supports the International Heat Flow Commission and uh, the International Lithosphere Program to develop a, a research data infrastructure for the global heat flow database, which means um, we got funding by the German Research Foundation for at least three years. Um, 
uh, with three postdoc positions to develop such an infrastructure in the framework of the International Heat Flow Commission. Um, the basic idea is here to have a research portal on global heat flow data, on heat flow projects, on heat flow researchers to, to bring visibility to the topic of, of heat flow we are all uh, associated to. And uh, yeah, we recently got this information um, and um, the preliminary research or the preliminary project start should be at probably April or May next year. So when hopefully the current pandemic wave is, is uh, gone in, in Europe. Um, and this is actually the first information I would wanted to give you um, and to forward to you. So probably as a kind of um, uh, as a kind of motivation, what we build up in the framework of the IHFC um, on the voluntary base will get some funding and some persons and manpower or women power um, to support over the next at least three years with two years of the possibility of extension. Um, that was the first I would wanted to share with you and uh, which I think is, uh, is a nice success so far. Um, if there are any questions, I can share the abstract of the project or uh, um, inform you uh, on a bilateral way about more information. Um, but that's for the moment to let you know about this. Second point um, I would like to make is just um, I know not every one of you has been uh, uh, part of the kickoff meeting last time. So um, the overall idea of a quality scheme uh, is following the restructuring of the global heat flow database. Um, um, the main issues here had been that we are that we are now have a parent child system of heat flow data uh, um, uh, included and that we have extended the database structure by a lot of metadata items. So that is much more than in the previously structure of the global heat flow database. And uh, we defined those metadata schemes uh, differently for data from boreholes and mines and from data from probe sensing. So the, the data that are relevant today is, is shown here in, in red and we want to discuss about it's the thermal conductivity related data. Um, I have outlined the database issues last time uh, and the developments. And if someone would like to have the paper, I can forward this uh, or even answer questions afterwards or at any time as you are interested for an exchange. My or our basic assumptions here, and sorry with the, uh, sorry with the uh, mess up here, our basic assumptions for the the process we are ahead, um, we are ahead is that um, first of all we have talked about a guideline during the kickoff meeting uh, and the difference between a guideline for new data and the treatment of the quality of legacy data. Um, my suggestion is that we make a difference here and uh, that we are aware that this are two different aspects. Second assumption for today is that uh, looking on the heat flow database, it becomes clear that a large share of data will be omitted due to incomplete data. Uh, I have I have shown the uh, experiences we we made or we are currently making in the German heat flow database, where we have to omit it seventy to eighty percent of the data simply because of incomplete basic data uh, that are not documented. Uh, and with that connected is the questions of scientific reproducibility of the data documented. And the third point is that um, only for a minor share of data, we can observe that we can technically calculate uh, uh, the error propagation of heat flow based on the uncertainties of conductivity and temperature gradient. So. Um, the uncertainty quantification um, based on the error propagation of data uh, can be applied only on a very small share. In the case of German data, that are only 15%. So our consequence or the, the implication here is that the uncertainty quantification itself may be not a proper, uh, proper item to 
to look on quality of feed flow data because it's only ap applicable to a very small share of data. Okay. So from this point of view, um, we see that we have different pillars when it comes to uh, quality of feed flow. The one could be, of course, the uncertainty quantification, but only for a small share. Um, the second one could be that one is looking on the technical robustness or reliability of the methods applied for conductivity or temperature gradient. Um, this means one checks how the how scientifically robust the methods are that are used to determine a representative conductivity value or a representative temperature gradient. And independently, but importantly, beside of this, there is the impact of terrain effects, obviously. And uh, the question is whether we find a workflow uh, or a quality scheme that considers those different aspects that are, are existence in parallel. Yeah. And that is a big challenge, I think. Um, I just have... This is quickly made, it's not that nice looking, but uh, just to, um, that had been ideas here. You know, we have for, for each heat flow interval, we have unknown conductivities, unknown gradients, and we have conductivities and gradients that are measured. Uh, and we know that the measured temperature gradients are underlying the terrain effects. Uh, we probably know, or we probably do not know, uh, but the results is that we have a measured heat flow and an uncertainty quantified for those measured heat flow uh, analyzed terrain effects, whereas uh, the methodological quality of the conductivity and gradients could be perfect. Uh, um, the resulting uh, heat flow density could be heavily disturbed by terrain effects. And this is something, um, if, if one, look, one is looking on terrestrial surface heat flow as a final outcome of an evaluation. Uh, and this is something we need to, to check and find a, a workflow, uh, how we deal with, with those aspects uh, in a consistent way. And today we are just starting with the impact of conductivity. So I think the, the, the overall discussion about the design of a quality scheme should be not take place today. Today, we should focus on the connectivity and agree on what is important here and what not. And afterwards, we will do the same with temperature gradients. And I think then, when we have clarified those basics altogether, then we focus on how we put this into a consistent scheme to consider uncertainties, reliabilities, etc. That would be my proposal, at least. And uh, I would like to hear your ideas if you agree with that, if you have different opinions on that uh, before we starting with the process. Well, I'm not Siri, but do you hear me? Yes. Um, first of all, I'm very grateful that I'm on board because Many, many years ago, I was working in heat flow, but then I diverted into applications and geothermal energy and all that. And um, I think we are on, well, happy to say we, and I feel at home again. Um, we are going to produce a kind of recipe book, how to make, determine, calculate, uh, good heat flow values. When I was in the committee, we got the task to produce a book that was the handbook. Um, you know, Hanel Riebach Stegener, but it grew far over this task. It is full of theories and, and all that. But if you want to have a recipe, how to make a good thermal uh, uh, heat flow value, then you are lost. So, uh, for example, you just mentioned gradient, gradient, uh, gradient. This is fine, but in one borehole, this gradient is never constant. It varies with the thermal conductivity profile. I have some 
funny experience. Some boreholes have very little, very little um, correspondence to the thermal conductivity dictated changes. I could even imagine some effect of the casing, which is a metal, this um, uh, just uh, levels temperature differences in the borehole, I don't know. So this is a real, real issue, how to deal with the temperature variation with thermal conductivities. The other issue is the corrections. Well, this, this is a real issue and uh, even the climatic change is now changing the top a few hundred meters temperature profiles. So uh, there is a lot to be done, but I would be very happy when finally a kind of a recipe book would come out how to do these uh, heat flow determinations correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Lazi. Other comments on that? I can't find the um, how to raise my hand digitally, but uh, maybe I can start like this. Sven, is this okay? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Ilma Kukkonen from Finland, and I'm happy to see quite a bunch of old good friends and guys in heat flow commission and heat flow circles here. Uh, and but uh, even more happier I'm to see quite many new faces that uh, it seems that the new generations are taking over. Uh, talking about these quality issues and heat flow determination errors and, and problems, uh, I think it's very important to take into account that what is the use of the database data. And that very much depends on the application of, uh, for the particular scientific question. We have people who are interested in climate change, and we are people who are interested in lithospheric uh, issues. They need uh, slightly different data sets. So what we store would be great if we would be able to store uh, uh, even the raw data, the temperature readings and the measured thermal conductivity values as a function of depth, plus then the metadata information. Then it would be possible for each user to select what they need. And, and uh, not to, to think in the classical way that heat flow is, is a value that uh, you need for overall, uh, uh, say, uh, crustal and uh, lithospheric temperature calculations or something like that. That's, not, that's just one use of the data. Okay. For our comments and just start with. Okay. Oh, Maria. Yes. So I just wanted to say, say I totally agree with what was just stated about the fact that a place for the metadata, I think is very important, like the raw data being someone who's run a lot of thermal connectivities and knowing how much variation there can even be in one sample or one set of samples. And then we stick one value into a, you know, into it at the end, understanding how much variation went into those samples, I think could be helpful. Okay, Niels. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, just a, a, a short comment uh, also to Lazi Rebach uh, uh, on this uh, this uh, heat flow handbook, which uh, I uh, worked on this as well and uh, co also two chapters. And uh, clearly, both on, on grading, which is not the, the main topic today, but also of conductivities, there, there are quite a, quite a lot of of recommendations and uh, uh, suggestions and topics treated in this uh, handbook already. So, and also a comment to uh, to um, Ilmo about uh, the use of heat flow data. Uh, that there, there are 
exactly uh, what, as uh, Elmo mentioned, uh, we had the, the classical uh, boundary condition for lithospheric modeling, uh, thermal uh, modeling of the lithosphere, but also uh, climate and um, groundwater motion, uh, geothermal energy, etc. And in particular on climate, then the, uh, the variations of gradient and temperature and variations of heat flow with depths from, from the surface down, uh, both on the, uh, the very shallow, the recent uh, warming and the, uh, the more uh, long-term warming, there the details of the data in terms of perturbations uh, is basically the signal. So, uh, so there are various, uh, various uh, aspects here, but also again, uh, like uh, Ilmo, I'm very happy to see this, this group here and also really very happy that uh, Sven is uh, taking care of this. He's doing very well and I think this is really a big job and, uh, and it is very important to look into this again. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thanks Niels. Um, okay, uh, if there are no other comments in the beginning, which is apparently not the case, um, then I, oh no, uh, Agu. Uh, hello everybody, Hi. nice to see you all. Uh, I'd like to ask a question, how many uh, heat flow values we are we will include in the database? Well, this is um, difficult to answer at the moment because um, you, you, you probably know that we have the so-called global heat flow data assessment project running, which means that we have at the, at the moment uh, the contribution from roughly 90 colleagues worldwide that uh, go through the primary or initial publications and the data associated to that and uh, update the database entries according to the new structure. So uh, a revision of the database is ongoing and will take at least three to five years. What um, I was thinking is uh, how many values per one point, one measuring point. We yeah. have uh, interval heat flow values, uh, apparent uh, corrected values, if we can include also the metadata for each value, then uh, it could be okay. That is the nice issue with the new structure. Um, the parent-child system uh, uh, addresses exactly your question, which means there is there are some parent elements, which means each location has a parent value of conductivity, which is the selected most representative conductivity value for this location. And under this parent element, you can have several child elements that could be different depth intervals, different determinations from different authors uh, during different times with different corrections, et cetera, et cetera. So with the associated metadata, one potentially could select different types of heat flow. Yeah? This could be a shallow heat flow value um, measured with an interval, which is clearly paleoclimatic perturbed, uh, and then um, you could have one which is correct for the perturbation and one which has additional registering heat production and represents a surface value. Uh, so this is the flexibility of, the, of this new database system that you, or the new structure and the idea of a parent-child system that you can report for the same location, different heat flow values, so-called raw data, uh, which represents different kind of heat flow. Well, one of the question is, how do we define the most representative value? That this, this is perhaps a longer discussion. Uh, yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, that's totally true. Um, from the technical point of view, we now have the possibility that we can act this way, uh, but we need to, um, to uh, let's say, discuss and argue how we will do this. Right. I do not see another raised hand yet. Oh, Niels again. Uh, well, just very briefly, I think this was mentioned already, uh, discussing about in particular thermal conductivity. I think it was Maria, right? 
mentioning this, that the, in particular in sedimentary sequences, it is very important to be aware of the problem of representability because conductivity really may vary. And you may have, you, you see also conductivity anisotropy in particular in clay rocks. So centimeter by centimeter, meter by meter, <laughs> conductivity really may vary. So this is, uh, this is and it's uh, very often you do not have the sedimentary cores. And even if you have, you need very, very often if you do not have homogeneous sections, you need very, very uh, dense sampling, which is possible, but it is very important to be aware of this. So sometimes you think that you have heat flow uh, variations with depths, uh, but actually it may uh, it just be a poor uh, representation of conductivity. Yeah, thank you. I think that that's an important point. And if we are looking on these single items that are related to thermal conductivity in the database um, in the new structure, then I think it could help us to address exactly that point. Um, I've, my starting point here would be that I assume that most of you more or less have had a look into the new structure um, of the database itself, which means the items itself. I, I, um, I would like to start with the, with the Google Docs document. We roughly have the definition of the items uh, listed there as well. So um, when, we, when we soon will go step by step through the single items, uh, that would be my proposal. You can read with, with gray background the definition as well, if you are not sure uh, at the moment what means what. Uh, and if there are questions, please just ask questions. And uh, with that, I would like to share the screen and start with you directly the work in the Google Docs document. Can you see my Google Docs file here? Yes. This is the case. Okay. Um, all of you had access to that. Um, you can uh, add your comments even after this workshop. So this will be uh, kept open. Uh, uh, for your comments or recommendations or um, uh, whatever. And I would like to use this document as uh, a documentation of what, what we are talking about today and uh, deciding probably today, right? Um, and you see on the left side here, we have different database items um, that are relevant. That this, the thermal conductivity number, uh, the averaging method for the interval of conductivity, the source for the conductivity determination, uh, the saturation state that is reflected uh, by our determination, the in situ pressure temperature conditions or the general pressure and temperature conditions of this determination, uh, the related functions, how pressure and temperature effect of conductivity is considered here, uh, and then the uncertainty uh, that is reported by the authors. Uh, that are more or less two, four, six, that are seven items that document uh, information that are related to conductivity. And um, now I would like to go step by step with you through the different items and decide whether the item is relevant for quality assessment or not. And we start here with the thermal conductivity number. Uh, in gray, you see that, that uh, the uh, Identify, not identification, the definition from the database paper. Um, and then the comments that had been given by several of you and us uh, on this issue. Um, and I really, I would like to uh, open here. I, I, I assume that you have read those comments. That's not totally new to, to you. So um, I would really like to open up the discussions at that point um, about your ideas points of views, um, uh, comments, uh, whether you find uh, the number of conductivity and probably in what case uh, relevant or not. And I, I kindly ask uh, Leif and uh, uh, Lazi uh, to pick up this discussion and to document this. And um, I will write as well um, to get your ideas here reported. Okay.
May I start? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I read all about the comments. Uh, I am uh, between you. I am very, very younger researchers. Uh, I'm all. I'm. I'm just reading what you what you comment, and uh, we, behind of you, I'm aware all of them <laughs> at the beginning. I'm really, really at the starting point uh, between us. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a bit difficult, but we can hear you. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm... <laughs> Excuse me, could you ask me something? Yeah, can, can you repeat the, the, the last part? I, I, I wonder whether there was a question that I did not get it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, but I didn't catch what you asked me. I'm so sorry. Oh, I just wonder whether there was a question and I did not get it, just due to the connection. But <laughs> the apparently same, there was not. Same problem. Uh, uh, same problem. Uh, I, I think I have an internet connection problem. Because of this, I couldn't catch all of what you say. But uh, I think we are talking about the items uh, that you sent me on Google uh, Google document. Uh, do you did you ask me what is my comment for the number of the collection? Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't. Uh, at the beginning, I am agree all of the co uh, comments uh, in my uh, in my data collection. I, I usually, could you, could you hear me? Could you hear me? Yes. It's, it's, it's all can, fine. It's I, all... I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get any reaction from you. It's, it's all fine, Elif. We can all listen to you. That's my impression. So just continue. Oh, okay. I think she will join again and let's uh, probably restart this round. <laughs> so Sven, while she's restarting, yes. this is Maria. Yeah. And this is, I guess, one of the places where my comment in the beginning about the ability, if you're running thermal conductivities on a divided bar, that you can get different values and then in the end you tend to throw something out or you like you you, you can average those different values um, or you average a group of samples to get a certain value and i'm and i think it there is so, so there is a an importance or a value in maybe understanding that there for one sample value that goes into the heat flow database there could be multiple runs on that and how different they are and up to this point I have always, you know, when you give it back to a customer or a person doing research, you give them a plus or minus. And you usually don't even tell them what the values are behind it. And that's something that I'm wondering as we move forward in the future, if there would be value to do that. So to, to record all the primary or raw connectivity values behind yes. a mean value? Right. Is there... So as a heat flow database community, I think we realize the how much variation that can be using the, a divided bar or an apparatus. And yet, I don't think the general community using our database would realize that. So I guess. So the, the suggest, this would be a suggestion from you that we should consider to report within the database or link in the database the primary conductivity measurements. Do I understand this right? Yes. So I guess this one, you know, talks about the fact that not the amount of repetitions of one measurement on one rock sample. And this, so that last sentence in this um, would be rather than saying not, you know, not the repetition, but to maybe say include if po where possible, include the repetition would be one of the items that I think could be beneficial.
Uh, Emil? Uh, what, what Maria mentioned is an important issue. Uh, originally, the Heat Flow Commission database was uh, constrained by the 80 characters per line, the space limit, and it was not possible to uh, include uh, original data or so. So it, it was inevitable that uh, in those times, the data was kind of a summary of what was done. Now we have no such limitation for including the detailed original data. And, um, and I know that many publications today even require that if you show some data, you also need to uh, uh, provide the, uh, the data somewhere publicly. And, and this would be an important issue to uh, advise people to provide the data as they were measured, of course, without, uh, with some technical corrections included. And then we can provide also summaries and averages and, and uh, whatever parameters calculated from those. But if you provide the original data, it gives a possibility to do many other uh, 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 applications from the data than, than what was the original in the original work. Hello, everybody. I am Gianluca Gola from, uh, from Italy. So I agree that it's very important for each it flow determination to, to have information about the temperature data, uh, thermal activity measurements. But uh, one of the major news of the new structure of the database uh, we are working on is the, the possibility to, to add the reference, no? in terms of uh, uh, DOI, DOE, for the original publication. So mm, I think it's very hard to implement a readable database, including the, also the, the raw data. But of course, when we... Uh, review and upgrade the, the new database, we can add the original paper. So uh, the user can uh, uh, retrace no? and, ca uh, and can um, retrieve the, all the data uh, used for the heat flow determination. So temperature, thermal conductivity, and, uh, and so on. Because it's very hard and it's a very long review the global database and uh, review also the, the raw data. And sometimes it is not possible for the very old data to, to have this kind of uh, information. This is my opinion about that. Marco? Yeah, I have more, let's say, practical issue that in some way go in the uh, direction of Gianluca. More, the more data that you are retyping into the database, the more is the risk of, uh, I don't know, making some mistake in the um, inputting of the data. Uh, because if you have to write, uh, I don't know, five numbers, uh, they, you have to, you have some, you can commit some errors, but if you have to input, I don't know, 200 thermal conductivity measurements, okay, it would be relatively quick because you can maybe import a, a CSV or text file or something, but still there is a possibility of uh, inputting error. Uh, that uh, we should also consider. So probably it would be better to input some average data or some parameters that we consider realistic and useful 
and and then report the uh, doi of the of the paper where the uh, person that is interested in checking that data set can go and see the original data. Well, I think one of the big benefit nowadays is that um, data are available digitally. That is a, a big difference compared to 20 or 30 years ago. And I think within the research community, at least, um, the availability of data is, um, first of all, it is clear to everyone. Second of all, more and more people are getting access to digital data simply because of the global um, um, open access movement, right? And about uh, the deal uh, or the, the deals made between research societies and uh, 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 publishers uh, and more and more of, of public research and publicly funded research uh, is finally published in open access data publication. So this, is, this, this was a kind of game changer in the past years. Um, I think for for legacy data, it will become quite hard, um, if not to say impossible, to get uh, to get known the primary or the raw data behind the heat flow calculation. This will be for most of the data almost impossible. Uh, data from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. I don't think that we have any chance to get primary data here. I see the value. If you said we should have those primary information connected, uh, we should know where are the intervals and what are the uh, the raw data behind. And for example, in the database, and now we have included the so-called ISGN number, so the inter international sample geo sample number. I don't know who is familiar of you with this concept. But this, uh, the concept, this is a, this is a raw identifier for geo samples. It's similar to the DOI uh, number for publications, uh, for example. The IGSN is a raw identifier for geo sample numbers, and it is more and more uh, accepted in geoscience to use this number as a unique identifier for rock samples. So this could be a way, for example. Uh, to link from a heat flow value in a database uh, to a thermal conductivity measurements made under this raw sample number, as one example. Second example could be, of course, we have free fields in the database as with a secondary publications DOI. So with the DOI as a connector, uh, one can easily connect the heat flow uh, determination made and reported in the database and the original publication or an associate database publication or, uh, or the publication of the primary temperature data set or, or, or. So we are in this term much more flexible uh, than we had been earlier with an 80 character limitation, of course. And, no, no, I think Ilmo was the next. Yes, to, to, just to add that um, I hope um, the inputting of the data to the database does not mean that everything has to be typed team number by number, but there is an option to uh, include simply uh, uh, ASCII files. Uh, for instance, modern logging data comes at a depth interval of 10 centimeters uh, from a borehole. It's two kilometer deep borehole, so there's a huge number of typing data in which is completely useless in, in the modern times, of course. This is this is just an, 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 a technical aspect here. Okay. Uh, regarding the technical aspect, I can clearly uh, state that there will be several import functions that make it as easy as possible to everyone uh, to upload the data uh, directly into the, data, into the database uh, with with an intermediate review process, of course. Uh, do, do we have also an option to add other uh, useful logs, uh, gamma logs, density, uh, whatever might be available, and lithology? This would be on your wish list. 
<laughs> oh yeah, sure. Yeah. But it, it's it's of course depending on, on on each case and the author if they are able to and willing to provide such data. But but uh, just uh, I mean that the database technically should be flexible, so that uh, it, it's able to accept such uh, information if, if it is there. Mm. For instance, I have I have hand drawn geological cross sections of heat flow. Uh, data sites from the 1960s. And they can be digitized and they can be uh, shown as pictures. That sounds uh, interesting. I haven't thought about this before, but technically, of course, this could be solved um, and could be easily included in, in the construction of the database. Sure. If this is of benefit or interest. Um, <laughs> Um, so, sorry, I will add something to to this comment. This is very relevant because uh, you can determine, for example, uh, conductivity from a, a matrix sample for, from a matrix rock, but you need uh, porosity and uh, fractures and everything. So having logs of porosity or fracturation. Uh, could be a good idea. Also, there is some works uh, in, the, in the literature uh, relating um, seismic velocity and conductivity. And there is some works on that. So can be also a velocity can be also a interesting to have this information, you know, because it's, as we have an extensive uh, mesh, uh, magnitude, that we can relate to with uh, with conductivity with a uh, intensive uh, magnitude. So this uh, additional information can be very interesting. Okay. My impression was a bit that um, the ongoing discussion is um, fading a bit around about more general issues. And um, if you agree, I would like to focus it a bit back to, um, to the basic idea of discussing the items itself and its relevance. Um, and would like to come back to the number of conductivity as a first database item. And um, about the questions whether this should be included if we consider quality of a measurement or not. And uh, under which circumstances, for example. And we have some comments already here in the document. You probably have read. And uh, yeah, probably you want to comment on those comments or you have different opinions, things like that. And um, if possible, I would like really to focus the next 45 minutes on the direct work on those uh, items. Um, and if someone needs the link, the link is in the chat uh, uh, reported. So you can, you do not need to access this via my screen, you can access your own and write your comments as well if you wish so. Sorry, Sven. Uh, one question about th this point. So, this uh, you are suggesting uh, to comment these uh, parameters, or uh, but for a potential uh, uh, thermal conductivity database for rock samples from the laboratory. That's all. Not, we are not talking about uh, uh, boreholes or, or, or uh, offshore measurements, no? We are talking about sampling rocks for a, a database, a general database. This is the idea, no? no. The, the basic idea today is that we, you know, we have a heat flow database and this database includes measurements on land and boreholes on sea and oceanic or uh, in lakes, so very different environments. And uh, we have the thermal conductivity number reported for those measurements in some cases, in a lot of cases not, but in some cases. 
the question is whether if we want to evaluate a heat flow density measurement and uh, check or find a, a scheme to evaluate the quality of this measurement, whether the number of conductivity determinations should be considered in this quality uh, assessment or not. So yes. this is actually the questions whether we can discuss about this in the community. Yeah, but the point, if in case of a borehole, this all depends on the, the lithology of this borehole. If we have a, granite, a borehole in a granite that is homogeneous, maybe with two samples is enough. If you have a variation in a, in a sedimentary area, you need much more uh, measurements of, of conductivity of samples. Ignacio, quick comment. Granites are not homogeneous. Okay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Completely agree. But uh, so all depends on the, the, the number of lithologies that you are drilling in. So, no, it's only that it's, it's confusing to me. That if, if we are, the point is that we need, uh, but I see that it's later coming in, in, the, in the document. If we want to, to characterize a rock formation, how many samples we need to characterize the rock formation. So the, the, the thermal conductivity measurement has to be linked to a rock formation with some characteristics. I don't know, with the description of this if it's a limestone, what kind of limestone and what is the characteristic of the, these limestones? I'm uh, sorry, I, this is confusing that I am confusing you and this is confusing also to me. Uh, I don't know if you see my point. That all depend on the context where you are taking the measure. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think that's exactly the point um, and uh... I think in some comments, uh, the dependence on the heterogeneity or the, lith uh, the rock type has been mentioned. And so probably there is no clear answer. It could be uh, an if-then combination we need to consider for some of these aspects. Uh, Sven, I have a comment on this. Um, so uh, Christoph Gelland from the University of Bremen. Um, I, when, when it comes to this metadata and reporting a TC mean um, when you report on the paper and um, say at a given point you have a um, three thermal conductivity values so you will obtain a TC mean out of these three values why not just adding uh, in the metadata um, how many numbers of discrete data were used to actually calculate the mean um, and a number will pop next to the TC mean and say that that will be the amount of data that, that were used to actually make that mean value. That is exactly the purpose of the TC number item. Yes, so I mean, if there is only one value in, in any given part of any paper, then the TC mean is just a discrete value and everyone then knows and, and that is fine, I guess. Okay, thanks. Will? Are you muted? Please. Will, you are muted. Please unmute. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> to follow on what you almost said, yes, definitely granites are not homogeneous and they have a lot of different variabilities. But I think what we're concerned with is the composite thermal conductivity over some distance between two points where we've measured temperature. The temperature is an accurate measurement, whereas the thermal conductivity could vary from place to place. But you just, And most of the boreholes we deal with are vertical. So we're interested in the heat flow in the vertical direction between those two points where we measured the temperature. So it's the aggregate or, aggregate or composite thermal conductivity that's really of concern. You can make dozens in there. One of them might be the exact thing, but the whole composite, maybe an average of those is the best. I've done a lot of work in sedimentary basins. Very fortunately, 
the basin I work with is essentially flat. And I find, for example, I can do a harmonic mean thermal conductivity calculation from the surface to four kilometers, putting together 54 different formations. And I will get a single number that I can apply to get a very accurate temperature in virtually every formation in there, if I know the heat flow. And you can work back and forth. Does that make sense or am I too far off base? Christoph again. Yes, just an idea that just came to mind. Um, you could take the advantage of building a database. That means that I found useful when, when you use um, any thermal conductivity value, when I use it in my uh, numerical models, to know where that value stands in the any given lithology uh, with respect to the the, the variation of thermal conductivity that will be in, in, say, in a basalt or any or granite we were talking about. You can take the advantage of, of the database to say like, okay, we've got that many thermal conductivity measures on that type of granite. So you will have an identifier for your thermal conductivity comes from that type of granite. And, and then, you can you could use the database to say okay compare my value that I'm looking at and see why it plots in in this range what's the range in the world of of thermal conductivity for that given lithology which comes back to the topic we had earlier and I think it's really important is to when assessing a heat flow value well you need to have a comprehensive view of what is the lithology and what are the thermal conductivity dominating at any given uh, important part of that lithology. You need to know the end members, you need to know what is there. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, to, to, uh, just to the question of the number of uh, a number of conductivity measurements. I think this is uh, just uh, one parameter looking into the quality of a heat flow value. There are quite a number of aspects to be considered. And uh, the number, I think this is clearly relevant to be stated somewhere. Sometimes uh, a small number is okay in other, in other circumstances, as exactly as uh, has been mentioned, uh, uh, a lot of measurements are needed. And also, uh, it was mentioned uh, now, uh, if you have a sedimentary sequence and you have, uh, say, uh, logs, and uh, you may calculate uh, thermal conductivity from, uh, from logs, uh, for example, with this uh, methodology suggested by Sven Fuchs, uh, you will have the possibility uh, to have a fairly accurate heat flow value by uh, simply just, if you have a bottom hole temperature, or a few bottom hole temperatures, uh, and you have a, a, a detailed conductivities from a lock, uh, you may have the possibility to have a fairly accurate uh, heat flow value, even if you do not have uh, a single uh, measurement in a borehole. So I think this is, it is clearly a, 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 big, a big value to have, to have the number. And uh, if you have locks, then this should be stated. Uh, you do not uh, necessarily have uh, any any measurements. Uh, still, uh, the you have to integrate all the information to uh, to evaluate the quality of a, a heat flow value. Yeah. Uh, ben? Yes, I think uh, I, I mostly agree to all what has been said to this TC number. And I think uh, because Graeme Birdsmore made a comment also later on on the, um, the calculated uncertainty of thermal conductivity. So uh, to, to keep in mind or think about 
we we ask or we are looking for the scheme to evaluate uh, heat flows at some stage later on. And I think, okay, it is uh, uh, nice to know if we have a lot of TC measurements for a certain interval and so on. Uh, but most relevant, I think it is to know if we had a suitable interval chosen. So there's another uh, uh, level above, which much more would be uh, 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 finally um, affect the quality of a heat flow determination. Um, so this is why I think, okay, it, it depends on uh, how the interval is, is built up or what is the lithology and the heterogeneity within there. Um, but then it's it's yeah just a number. So I, th I think it is, if we look later on, on how to rate on the importance of reporting TC numbers, I would say, okay, it is less important. So also uh, it, it is less important to know the mathematically uh, calculated uncertainty of the thermal conductivity. But what we have to know is the uncertainty of the, of the or the, the, the uh, how representative the, the value is, which is uh, determined. Of course, this is, this is the problem. Um, because I just realized that that Graham Birdsmore sees something that the rating proposal different in some state. It just depends on how you rate on it or what you see, if you understand it. I think it's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the point um, that we cannot just, I think we cannot just judge on the, uh, uh, yeah, so it's nice to have the information, but we cannot judge on the TC number itself very um, make a finally judgment on that. Okay, um, Helmut. Um, I have a short uh, note regarding the TC in terms of how we are looking at the TC because the T, uh, most, I think we have a lot of community members who are coming from the, maybe from the rock physics, petrophysics. And they are looking at TC, like we have a sample from a certain depth, from a different, a certain lithology, and then we measure a number. And that's why it's for, uh, especially this community is quite also important also for others, what kind of sample it is. So the lithology that what we have, heard earlier is very important because that is how in rock physics we look at these values. So basically then you have a location in long net and depth and you have a lithology that is a TC number. That means we have a relative discrete sample. That means you have no interval or, or in, in terms so small that it's not relevant. The other ones are coming from the logging data where you actually have also a lot of data, but looking at interval data. And from that one determine how the TC value. So both have their relevance, both have their importance. So the question is putting this into different perspective and then uh, make it relevant in the database and show, okay, this is from a rock, uh, clearly from a sample in the lab or this is from interval measurements. Thank you. Um, I would pick up this here um, because you address, I think you address an important point that um, is a bit covered by the item TC source um, where we clearly address where the measurements of conductivity is coming from. Um, but, um, I, I wonder whether, you know, I think that most people here think that conductivity is somehow, as the number of conductivity is somehow important, but it all, always depends on the uh, conditions, on the lithology, on the rock types, on the length of the interval. So um, 
I wonder whether the importance of the connectivity number uh, is a matter of the variability in the interval we have. Uh, so that it could be a function of the variability um, because the more, uh, the, the, the less variable an interval or a rock is, uh, uh, the less important is the number of conductivity values apparently. Because if I have very homogeneous intervals, I have learned this in, in Denmark and the chalk section, uh, if I have very easy rock types, I apparently do not need that much connectivity values to get a representative value. If I have very complex sedimentary strata or whatever strata, uh, where I choose long intervals with a high variability probably that is reflected by a high variability in the gamma ray response, for example, uh, because I have a lot of changes of rock types in the interval I choose for a conductivity determination, I apparently need much more discrete conductivity points to, to get a value that represents uh, these highly heterogeneous interval. Uh, so I wonder whether it could be an uh, an approach to consider this TC value as relevant as uh, independence of the variability of the interval uh, selected. Yeah, probably Maria. Yeah. Yes, this is where I think your comment is of value because we talk about variability and yet if we, throughout the history of the thermal conductivity heat flow community have not been stating how much variability there are in our samples. Unless you're the person running samples, I don't think you realize how much variability there could be. And because, Will, you're on the line and you were running connect your group a few years ago, went back and ran a lot of conductivities on the core logs in the North Dakota repository. Do you want to talk about potential for how much variability there is in a you know, across different types of rocks? Yes, there is a lot of variability and it is, <clears throat> you can't just say this formation has that variability. It's going to change dramatically, almost by a factor of two in some cases. <clears throat> um, and we're doing a lot of that. I hope to get something done in the next year that will answer a lot of those questions. We're working with the core library to do as many samples as we can right now. What we haven't been able to do in the past was go into a single borehole and get multiple conductivities from that borehole from the sedimentary section because you know as all of this is well company data and they only collect core samples where they have some interest not continuously like we would like to have but <clears throat> yeah it is highly variable uh, we were thinking hey you've got a limestone or you've got a dolomite this is the conductivity you could be off by a factor of two Helmut again, you're muted. This is actually what I mean because a TC is actually a value of, it's a rock property as we know already. And if we have a section with different rock types, we, we naturally see a variation in, in the TC value. And so the question is, is, is this enough? What, what you have said Sven, that putting uh, just at a certain point at depth, and this is a number for that depth, or maybe depth interval, but if we go to another lithology, we have another TC. Yeah. So that is a, the question to, to, to look at, at rather than the intervals. And the intervals separate when we are coming getting data from the well data. I, would, I, I do not fully understand the point. Um, probably just because I don't know, I don't, did not get the point yet. What, what exactly do you mean? Um, 
in, in uh, the thermal conductivity is 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 a is depends on the different type of rock that's yes. what we have seen and have learned so if you we have just uh, heard from many researchers or our colleagues here that if you have a borehole section with different ethologies uh, you you get automatically a various number of tcs so if you want to have uh, uh, make an average or whatever depends really on <laughs> where you want a borehole average, you want a lithology average. So question is, is this really necessary or just keep in, the, keep in mind, we just measure one point. If you go to the core lab and measure one point, okay, that's a point source, it's a point information. If depends on the lithology, finished. If somebody is going in the well data and measure uh, logging and say, okay, we measure intervals, maybe it covers also a lithology, it can cover more than one lithology. It's another type of data where you actually measure intervals. That's from my side. Okay. Okay, thanks. Probably Argo on this. Well, as much as I understand, we, we discuss if uh, TC number is uh, the parameters that should be included in the database uh, and that can be used to evaluate the heat flow data. So, yes, sure. Uh, by looking at the database, uh, you see there are, well, depending on, on location, there can be a low number of zero or, or some bigger number. Uh, but the evaluation of data is made by a user. Well, we can also evaluate the data. We can use uh, additional parameters, that is uh, evaluation by the uh, person who entered the data. But in, in, uh, uh, when we talk at, at, about the database itself, uh, well, users will charge the data according to their needs. And if, uh, if the number of uh, thermal conductivity measurements is low, so the user must go a bit deeper to, to think again if this data should be used for his or her uh, purpose of analysis or, or whatever. If, uh, if uh, any data is good, then okay. If you need to go deeper using the data, then well, the user starts to evaluate the data. So if we... Uh, add the number of thermal conductivity measurements in the database, the user has more uh, basis to, to make judgments. So uh, I, I think uh, thermal conductivity number should be included in the database and, and user can judge it. That's all. Um, the conductivity, the, those items here are already included in the database. So this is not the question anymore. Um, this information is, um, uh, is saved. The question is just, if we think about quality assessment, should we consider the information from this field or not? Um, that is where we are going now and what is the purpose of this meeting, that we think about these single items that has been defined uh, whether we want, we think it is beneficial to consider it in a quality assessment or not, or deep, independently of the circumstances, yeah? because you can consider it under, under single cases and others not, for example, right? As conductivity number could be a function of the variability or the rock type, for example, whatever we think. Just the question, is this relevant if we think about quality? or not. And my impression is that most of you think, yes, it is relevant uh, if we have complex interval uh, strata, for example. Do we need additional parameter, perhaps? The, uh, certainly, it is a, a good uh, basis to, to evaluate, but not, uh, not the perfect. Maybe uh, a user, uh, the, the person who enters the data, gives an uh, opinion about the, this um, thermal conductivity. Well, is it enough or not 
to, to uh, characterize this interval or this borehole, this location. Ignacio. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I think it's yes, this is very relevant. Uh, we, are, we are talking about uh, using the the like uh, given a sorry a tag of uh, quality or a quality control for a, a heat flow determination so it's very relevant but it's strongly linked to the to, to the number of formations or lithology so if we find a way to to link both numbers the name of of lithologies or, or formation uh, cross and the, the number of uh, TC determinations, maybe we can find. So this is linked to the TC source parameter that you have uh, in the same document. I don't know how, if we can find a way to, to link these two parameters. So uh, again, if, if we have, for example, four uh, main formation in our borehole, and we have, uh, for example, four determination for each of one, I think it's a good rate. I don't know, uh, uh, all depend on the, 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 meet, the meters and everything. But if we have four formation and we have only four or uh, three measurements of uh, thermal conductivity, it's not good. So maybe this is, could be a, a way to evaluate it. I wonder whether this applies to the number, uh, to the item TC averaging method as well. Because I think this is a let's say it, a tripod uh, balancing between a number of values, uh, the the source we have for those values, and the type how we average everything. Um, it's probably not not a simple linear thing, <laughs> alone. I know, not not at all, not at all. Uh, I know, but hmm. maybe also I don't know if he's you have here TC source. For example, here we can find also a, a number for the name of lithological formation that we are, I don't know, that we have in this uh, heat flow point or heat flow measurements, I don't know. Only to have an idea if you can play with it two numbers and take a decision of the quality as a user of the quality of these uh, uh, heat flow determinations. Okay, so I, I don't know, Ilmo or Maria, who was the first one? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so technically, I, I think that uh, where we can apply a simple technical uh, quality control parameters is the technical quality of the data. So if the heat flow is determined like a, like a interval method, so we have temperature data from which we have calculated the gradient. The gradient has a certain error, which is simple to determine from the regression one. And then we have thermal conductivities from which we calculate the average, and then we have a standard deviation of those. And we, we provide this information basically and if you want, we can, we can create some sort of a numerical uh, quality codes for that. But then it gets much more complicated when we are talking about how representative is the heat flow value for different purposes. So technically this is the data we have in the borehole, yes. But if we uh, uh, look at the paleoclimate of the site, the paleoclimate is essentially unknown. We can assume that we know that the paleoclimate and we can make a paleoclimatic correction. It's difficult to say if the applied paleoclimate is correct or not. So well, th those uh, things of, of uh, 
any any derivatives we we calculate from the uh, reported data it's very difficult to to uh, give any simple quality uh, parameters but it's very simple to use numerical uh, 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 factors calculated from the number of uh, observations and, and uh, how they technically uh, define the gradient and the average thermal conductivity. That's easily doable. Yes, but you can measure uh, temperature every 10 centimeters and with a very high accuracy in millikelvins. But this is not so easy to do with uh, thermal conductivity. This is main. No, it is not. But th therefore, we have a variation in the data, and the data shows a standard deviation. You can calculate the, the error in the mean. But these basic parameters are there, so we, we can use them if you like. But it, it's, it's then much more difficult to give a, a, a standard deviation for values which are estimated using logging data. So you can get some numbers, of course, but uh, then they are not they are not compatible. I think we have to be pragmatic here. So if we have data which uh, reports the temperatures and the gradient values and their errors and the 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 uh, uh, conductivity values and 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 their uh, individual errors and and their um, uh, error in the mean. And standard deviation. These are these are very useful, simple parameters that anybody can calculate and produce. But then, uh, how how I do a paleoclimatic correction is a completely different issue. And you, uh, uh, you 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 can you can uh, fight with me for for years uh, for one single correction. That no, Ilmo, you're not right. Well, I am right. Well, that's useless. Maria? So, Ilmo, I, I appreciate the fact that in the end, it all boils down to our the bottom heat flow and you know how we combine the different types of data. I think that is, in the end, what people in the community and outside our community will use the databases for. What I was thinking about was that, is there not a method that we couldn't take each of these and like you know, whether it's a thermal conductivity source, which some people feel is really important or understand the importance or the number or the saturation, each one of these parameters, could we create a sliding scale so that it would be a situation where, um, you know, maybe it's not always the number, maybe it's the number in certain situations that is of importance. And so we could have a cumulative conductivity value that could then be um, you know, the details could be within the database, but in the end, that final number could be something that is you know, given a weighted value for the thermal conductivity contribution to the heat flow. Of course, if you, you want to rate the, uh, the data, uh, I would uh, say that uh, um, thermal conductivity is measured from core samples are very representative. But they are spot-like. But uh, uh, then, if you make estimates from logging data, so it's using different proxies, that's also good. Uh, but that's not perhaps not that reliable. So there's always a possibility for a systematic error. And then, when you go further and you just know the stratigraphy in a in a sedimentary section, for instance, that's uh, already approaching guessing. That's even lower accuracy of the data. And, and uh, at the end of the line, there would be just these rumors that uh, the thermal conductivity is about 2.5. That's the worst of quality. But, but uh, this is the way we can, we can find these uh, quality factors, if you like. We just have to rate these. If, if we say that laboratory data measured and, and uh, in, a, in a, say, kind of a certified and, uh, and a quality laboratory uh, that uh, calibrates often, et cetera, so this is a good uh, source for thermal conductivity. And then we, a very important thing to report is, is this dry conductivity or saturated conductivity? Right. And then you ask, how did you measure the, uh, uh, your porosity? 
Did you measure it uh, this way or that way, pycnometrically, uh, or bathing or saturating and, and uh, oven drying or what? But, but uh, 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 the, in the classical way, in the heat flow co uh, commission database, uh, if you look at the, the old legacy data, those data uh, points which had several uh, depth intervals, had several thermal conductivity averages, and also reported how many uh, 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 measurements were included in each number. Those were the most respectful and the most reliable hockey data. And I think this information should, should not uh, uh, too much uh, change. So the, in principle, trust the conductivity measurements and, and uh, uh, then the other indirect methods come, maybe we need to find for them a kind of an order of uh, reliability if you if I may say so. And now, now I will be silent for a minute. All right, and I'm gonna add one more comment. And that is, as someone who works in the heat flow and the geothermal resource side of it, I find that we have diminished the value of our heat flow and even thermal conductivity values because so often we are using estimates and things like that, but people are not, um, or using correlations from other basins and things like that. And so I see right now as an opportunity for the geothermal community and the heat flow community to move forward and give our research more value by adding more understanding behind how that data, how that one value, whether you know, in the end it's heat flow, but how that has been um, composed. And until we ourselves give it the value that it deserves, I think that we're gonna continue to have people using estimates and not running connectivity samples um, because they feel like they can just say, oh, it's gonna be about you know 2.1 and go with that instead of saying we, we need to measure values. And that's my comment for the end of this. I think Will, you are the next, please. Yes, could I share a screen? You can share a screen. Sorry, uh, I need to. Uh, ba, ba, ba. You should have the possibility now. Does it work? Yes. The uh, <clears throat> all but the uh, little diamonds that are light blue were measured with a divided bar sample at the pressure of the formation. Look at the variability there. Those are <clears throat> primarily carbonates, some sandstones. The light blue are continuously cored, pure shale. This is a Cretaceous shale samples that we've measured with Graham Beardsmore's <clears throat> uh, portable divided bar. I just wanted to show how variable things can be in the same formation with the same rock type, doing everything as Ilmo was saying, we have to make sure that these things are saturated. There's the correct pressure. We've closed up the pore space and so on like that, but they vary tremendously. So I'll stop. Uh, sorry, uh, how these measurements were taken from um, from were, with a conductivity samples. matter, with a conductivity matter, conductivity matter. Oh, a divided bar. Uh, yes. So it's is matrix uh, conductivity. Right. Is the Okay. Well, this is an impressive ability, I think, uh, and we need to seriously take this in, into account. Um, well, probably, Ilme, you you have focused in the first part of your answer on on uh, on the on the heat flow uncertainty determination with our propagation. So this is truly a, a purely technical act. Um, but I've learned from the database that for most of the entries, the information required for that, for the legacy data is not available yet. 
we will fill up this a bit over the assessment project and the review of the single primary publications. But it, it just can be of help for a part of the current legacy data. Um, and probably and hopefully for everything, everything which is submitted from now on in future, because we can uh, ask all the authors to provide such data. Uh, um, the second part you addressed was the question of reliability of the connectivity and the probably selected intervals. And this is, I think, where we really need to focus on because the technical calculations of error propagation, this is a technical act. We can do this for the rule database once and that's it. If the initial data required for that is available. Um, but we need to talk about how we want to evaluate the methodological approach to determine the conductivities and the gradients in the most representative way for the interval. Yeah. And we can do this based on the information given by the database, which means based on the database items we have already defined. But we need to agree and to argue and to, or to discuss what we think are the important pieces of information we have in the database. Is this averaging methods, is the saturation, is the saturation more important than the number of conductivities? Or are the pressure temperature conditions more important than the saturation? So we need to rate the information we get from the database against each other. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced and I know saturation is really a big issue. Huh? We see this in the German database. We have underrated the heat flow here by probably 15 milliwatt per square meter uh, uh, nationally because a lot of uh, uh, data from the past based on dry measured connectivities. So that's underestimated. Uh, but there are other issues. Pressure temperature conditions, is this important or not? Do we have enough information to value this? Uh, um, so I think we have those seven items in the database, which provides us a single piece of information about connectivity. And we need to argue now, which one is the most important from our point of view and should be, should be considered more important in, in a quality scheme we want to develop. And that does not mean that others are unimportant, but probably saturation is much more important than talking about an averaging method, because whether you use a, a thickness weighted harmonic mean or a thickness weighted geometric mean does not produce that much big differences, right? So from this perspective, I would like to bring the discussion back on the question that we discuss about which item is important here or more important than others and which one should be considered when we talk about the methodological methodological quality of a heat flow determination or a conductivity determination in this term. Helmut. Uh, one moment. Uh, from my point of view, I would uh, first say what we have learned already and know that pathology is uh, one of the main important issues, uh, plus saturation. However, we also heard Maria that because uh, heat flow measurements in the lab were not so popular, except for the people working in radioactive waste uh, repository research in the past, geothermal is now coming more. So we will get and see a lot of data coming probably in the next five years. However, we have to make the decision now. And I think we have data enough also from the lab and from the well to say, what is the real main topics? Lithology is the main topic because we see saturation is the main topic. Now we can argue, is porosity a main topic? Because in carbonates, you run out of problem, uh, run out of issue because you have see a variety of porosity range. And the question is in situ pressure is seemingly also from what I know, not so critical because we are not going so deep very often. So in terms of 
quality uh, rating the data is what type of source, rock type, and also what type of technology is used uh, in terms of uh, how many order and, and how many samples are measured, whether we have single data, also single sample data or averaging data uh, in the lab. In the well, I maybe leave it to others, uh, but on the, on the lab side, uh, as soon as often as possible having single data and averaging can be done a later order if not necessary at all. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Gianluca. Okay, I think that uh, finally, in order to, to define the, the quality of uh, thermal conductivity data, we have to take into account uh, all the kind of correction a thermal conductivity value need to be uh, re reliable for a specific depth interval. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, measurement on dry condition, okay, are uh, not the best way in order to to, to, to measure the thermal conductivity, but uh, at the same time, there are some lithologies that uh, cannot be saturated in order to, to maintain the, the, the solidity. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we can measure the, the thermal conductivity at a dry state, but we have to correct the thermal conductivity value we uh, obtain in laboratory to uh, evaluate the in situ value. So in order to, to define finally the, the, the quality, I think we have to take into account how many correction we apply to the original data in order to uh, obtain the, the better as possible uh, value at depth. So of course, uh, saturation is uh, important, but uh, we have also to, to define uh, the, the kind of saturation at depth. And uh, so I think in order to be pragmatic, so we have to, to define what are the, the best method in order to, to define the, the thermal conductivity and also how many correction we have to to apply for the pressure, temperature, saturation, and uh, and so on. So, oh. a question: Have you people taken a look at the heat flow? Uh, the handbook, handbook of terrestrial heat flow density determination. Surely many of you have, and many of you are authors of the book. But as mentioned by, by Lachi already, uh, we have here uh, recommendations, for instance, considering uh, thermal conductivity data. And, and uh, I think these are still quite valid that we can find here in the book by Alan Beck. In this chapter, so that uh, there's a certain recommendations for the type of the uh, uh, measurement unit or method, and there are uh, then also uh, requirements that uh, <clears throat> that the laboratory apparatus should have an imprecision less than two percent and inaccuracy of less than five percent, for instance. And then uh, calibration for for uh, for the measurement is given here as well, and then the procedures, how to uh, work with the data, and also how to report. Replicate specimens should be measured in sufficient number to give a formation conductivity inaccuracy of less than 10 to 15 percent. So this was something that uh, was agreed, uh, I think, in the, uh, after quite some uh, big uh, amount of work in the 80s. Niels, you can you can comment this better you because you were an author. 
Yes, very briefly. This is also what I, I mentioned earlier that uh, this handbook uh, actually has uh, several chapters uh, focusing on this. There is a chapter on heat flow, there is a chapter <coughs> on uh, temperature, temperature gradient. This is not, uh, I uh, co authored uh, continental heat flow and the temperature, uh, temperature gradient uh, chapters. Temperature and temperature gradient is not that uh, difficult still. But there are various aspects in, in terms of uh, correcting bottom hole temperatures, et cetera, looking if, into if there are uh, groundwater uh, perturbations. And uh, I fully agree that uh, in particular on the conductivity and also on the, uh, on the heat flow, how to, how to calculate uh, heat flow, I mean, particularly on the conductivity, I agree with Ilmo that this is uh, highly valuable. Uh, to look into this, and it uh, it uh, it uh, it uh, touches uh, and focuses on several of these uh, topics, which we are which uh, which we are discussing. Again, perhaps coming back with a general comment, uh, there is clear. Uh, I may not fully understand, but this is perhaps because I was not uh, taking part of the first meeting, and uh, also on on the the whole process. I think it's it's really quite complex to have this uh, quality uh, quantitative quality measure uh, measure and also priorities in details because uh, several of these uh, elements are, are closely linked. Uh, for example, litology is of course important. It is important if you have great variability of litology. Uh, and this links to the more variability in litology you have, the more uh, the more measurements you need. And this is uh, then also uh, this is also embedded into this uh, statement with Ilmo uh, remote uh, Ilmo just uh, just mentioned that uh, so a sufficient number of mes measurements, if you have them, the possibility of course, etc. A sufficient number of measurements should be taken in order to cover the variability. To keep the uh, as far as possible the the mean value down to uh, was it ten to fifteen percent or yeah the better uh, the better uh, it is uh, the better uh, 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 of course it will will be the the final uh, heat flow value but I think it is a fairly complex thing also saturation yeah this is important if you have a significant porosity if you have an almost zero porosity homogeneous granite uh, ilmo may say that this is not <laughs> this is very seldom but you may have fractures etc but then of course uh, saturation is less critical you may come closer to the uh, the uh, a representative value if you have a homogeneous granite uh, with with very little porosity and fractures so again again it uh, really depends very much so. I think it, this rating, it may be a good thing for discussion, but I think uh, uh, at the end of the day, it is quite complex, actually. Uh, Sven, perhaps you should comment on this because you are, you have been thinking a lot of this uh, now. Well, needs. I think this was the right comment to the right side before, because it's perfectly summarized <laughs> <laughs> some parts of our discussion. And yeah. uh, regarding the uh, the time we have already, I think or we think it could make sense if we try to sum up um, the discussions of today and um, probably to um, come up with a synthesis of what we have talked about today and what you have brought on ideas and discussion elements and so on to prepare a second workshop on the issue of conductivity and to stop this for today. Um, but to uh, get all your comments and uh, I have written a lot of your comments down. And I hope that we got most of the intentions right. Um, so we will prepare uh, a summary and uh, um, let's say minutes of these meetings and I kindly invite you then when we circulate this that you probably check whether we got your points and ideas right uh, in the right tonus and just add to 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 those uh, comments that we just take this think over 
what we have talked about today and probably meet in three to four weeks again. Um, and I would like to have a meeting this year uh, on, on the second conductivity issue and then probably start with uh, prepare a new discussion then probably in three weeks uh, and um, yeah just take over what we have talked about today and start again on this issue with three weeks of time to settle everything and to think about uh, would that be this is a, a, do you agree on this proposal let's say but I, I don't want to uh, uh, waste time. So, Imu, if you want to add something. Yeah, uh, I, I have a technical question. Yeah. This is the heat flow determination handbook. Uh, could it be possible that we would have a digital version of that available on the uh, uh, web pages of the commission? Sure. I don't know if it costs money or something, or, or is, is it available as a Google book, but uh, probably not. Well, the current it, price is very I'm... useful because I think many of uh, uh, us ha have not uh, seen the book yet. Well, I think the price at Amazon is at the moment at around 680 euros, but there is no exemplar available. Um, but um, there, technically, on the Commission's web page, we have an internal area where probably this could be shared, but I don't. I'm. I don't think that there is an official digital version available. But probably someone yeah. knows this better. Okay. Probably maybe we can ask who has access to to this book. I think that are not that many persons. I have a copy. Many of us have. have. Of course, it's easy to scan that, but these copyright issues are something that we have to be careful. Nils, you are muted. Nils, you are muted. Nils, you are muted. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, well, at, as a minimum, there is at the end of these, uh, these uh, chapters with the recommendations, there is a summary of recommendations, as uh, I think Ilmo stated some of this. At least, as a minimum, that would be highly valuable. And I think this could uh, somehow be scanned uh, without violating, or, or you could ask, uh, ask the, the company. So, uh, yeah. Um, my proposal here, in the first place, I would ask the, uh, uh, the publisher if they would allow this in internal groups of the commission. Yeah. Probably they, they agree on it due to yeah. the time yeah. since this book has been published. Yeah, and there, there are, uh, some, of, some of the chapters are more critical, in particular this temperature, temperature gradient, thermal conductivity, uh, continental and oceanic heat flow. Those are, 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 are the more critical, in particular the conductivity is, uh, is, uh, is uh, very, by Alan Beck is very important. I think. Okay. Um, then my proposal is we will prepare minutes. We will circulate this to you as soon as it this is possible for us that uh, you have a week to to comment on it, to extend it, or to to um, to argue. <laughs> um, we will send around uh, a doodle link for a new uh, workshop time that you can uh, um, yeah that we have a poll about the new date. And uh, I will share the link of the uh, record of the session to you as well. And um, yeah, we will prepare a new meeting uh, summarizing the discussion uh, from today. And uh, thanks again to every one of you that you have joined here, that you have brought your ideas, critical thinking. Uh, I think something where we can bridge from the very experience to the very fresh uh, ones of us uh, in this business. Um, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to the next time uh, and hope that we uh, can keep moving forward with the spirit and uh, bring up something together. Great, thanks for your attention and for your joining. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Sven. Thank you everybody. Great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.